Welcome to Breeder Syndicate 2.0, where we explore the history of a clandestine scene, researching everything from cannabis strain history, old smuggling tales from the first person perspective, to breeding science and news on current subculture. I'm your host, Matthew, and I'll occasionally be joined by my homie Not So Dog, breeder and grower from Mendocino, to speak on these subjects and sometimes interview other participants. Our goal is to document this history before it's written by corporations and others who just weren't there. Let's start writing some wrongs. Welcome to the underground. Hey everyone, welcome to Breeder Syndicate. I'm Matthew here with my co-host Thousandfold, and today we're going to unlock and unfold some of the nomenclature um, with some examples and hypotheticals on um, different strains to try to give people a better idea past just the the term F1 and F2 and all that and just brief ideas of what it means. Yeah. Yeah. Cause last week we, you know, we did a fairly textbook overview of various concepts um, in breeding theory and science. And so this week we're definitely getting um, more concrete. We're definitely getting into some of the actual real life examples um, of breeding and different real life scenarios. Um, and yeah, I thought, I think, one way we can begin is we did talk briefly about, uh, for example, last week, how we don't, it's rare to find a true F1 hybrid in cannabis, for example. Yeah. And we talked about how um, that Mendelian model of uh, true F1 hybrid and then F2 gen with uh, genotypic uh, segregation uh, doesn't happen really in cannabis. Mm -hmm. So I think Matt wanted to address some of that. And we can start with the F1, Matt. Yeah. You know, um, what are examples of F1s in our world? And how so, do you actually make them? So I'll start really with what they should be and how they would be made in terms of uh, actual agricultural breeding versus cannabis. So the definition of an F1, we went over that last week. It's, it's crossing two distinctly different genotypes um, together, essentially, right? Like you're crossing two stabilized genotypes together is the idea. But um, yeah, two distinctly different specifically. That's very, very key because in cannabis, it's used differently. So in this idea, you would want to take a Thai land race, um, something very, very long flowering Thai for example, or Burmese or any of that kind of stuff and cross it to something traditionally more Afghani that's interbred or um, in this example, let's say any Afghani will do, any Afghani will do from like a, a land race region. So that would be a real F1 hybrid. And by crossing those two inbred lines, that's where you would get hybrid vigor. And that's why pe when people talk about hybrid vigor in cannabis, and it doesn't really necessarily apply because cannabis is naturally vigorous anyways. And most of the things that we see in cannabis are polyhybrids. So what we see in cannabis when we see F1s typically, and even I use this this way because it's, it's how it's commonly understood in trying to make it anything different, even by calling it a polyhybrid F1, it would totally confuse everyone. And it does when you do it. Um, as people mm -hmm. understand it, is that it is just two different strains crossed to each other in cannabis. Simply put, two different yeah. unrelated strains. Uh, and, and in some cases, even related. Yeah, yeah. And technically, the, that is correct to still call those F1s. Um, we're just distinguishing that from the uh, true F1 hybrid type F1, right? Correct. I mean, it's, it's a commonly accepted. I don't know if it's correct. I don't know if it's even correct to call it correct, but it's accepted. I think it is. Yeah, I think it is. I, I think I did look that up to be like. For polyhybrids? Still, polyhybrid do you still call it an F1 for like, yeah, heterozygous uh, or polyhybrid crosses? I think they're still technically F1s, but I, okay. We'll just say that we're not entirely sure, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just because F1s have to be two distinct genotypes. I don't know how they just scrub that for heterozygous. It's a major part I of the think definition. That, I think that F1 still designates the filial generation, filial generation um, regardless. as distinct from, yeah, 
Yeah, exactly. Okay. So then it is, be, if, if that's the case, then it's being used correctly in cannabis, if that's the case. And um, yeah, so in this example, um, most people would say like uh, OG Kush cross to purple Urkel, whatever, if they're seed lines, you know, male, female seed lines, you would call that an F1 in cannabis. Um, uh, a great example of a real F1 in cannabis, as I see it, would be something that CSI is currently working on, which is his uh, land race Burmese that was from Preservation Dude and crossing that to the Christmas tree bud um, IBL line, which is, it, it is to the point of mm. where if you, if you pop seedlings from it and you run clones of those seedlings of each different seedling at the clonal level, they all look pretty uniform. You know, it's, it's different when they're seedlings and seedlings, as most people know, seedlings, like as they grow up and, and mature and you take clones of them, they change. They, they like the clone is not usually the same exact plant that the seedling is. It's very rare. Um, and in clonal form, they all seem to line up pretty well looking like clones of each other. So it is, it is a, uh, I think IBL by definition for cannabis. So that would be a good example of a true F1 hybrid in cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. And just to clarify, I think what we are trying to point out is that when F1 is, when the term F1 is used, there are actually two possible interpretations or uh, meanings. One of that is the true F1 hybrid in the Mendelian sense that Matt's trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And then there is F1 in, in, in designating uh, the filial generation um, and nothing beyond that. So in cannabis, most of the time it is the latter. Uh, but yes. there are exceptions like the one Matt just gave. Yes, there's always exceptions to every rule on that. On, on cannabis, it always finds a way to have an exception. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about an F2? So F2 essentially is taking um, the, the progeny, the resulting seeds or progeny um, of that F1 hybrid, popping those seeds, selecting a male and a female, or essentially a male and a female, um, to keep it simple. A male and a female, and crossing them together, resulting in the F2 generation, the second filial generation. And, and mm -hmm. as it goes on to F3, F4, F5, it's just that same process. Each next generation, select a male and a female for the next generation. And hopefully you're selecting for traits. If you're working them generations, um, that usually helps take it a direction. Yeah. Um, is there, are there good examples of F2s or like F2s being used for, you know, particular reasons? Okay. So, um, uh, an example of an F2 would be like with the blue bonnet. I got so few seeds of the F1 to pop that I wanted to immediately do F2s of it. Um, and that was to open it up and see what, what's actually in the blue bonnet. Um, yeah, that, that's. That, that's the perfect example of why you would take something to an F2. Um, and I didn't necessarily want to open up the whole thing, per se, like by doing an open pollination, because I already knew the direction I wanted to go, and they were already showing those traits. So hopefully that helps yeah. make sense with that. Yeah. And, and in F2s, like we've mentioned before, that's where you're likely to see a greater proportion of recessives um yes. and greater uh a greater kind of uh variation in the permutations of of genes right like in exactly the yeah yep cool all right i think the next one we want to move on to was the s1 s1 and i think so, there are many 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 examples of this yeah so that would be specifically self. And a lot of people get this confused. They think all feminized seeds are S1s, whereas all S1s are feminized. It's true, yes. whereas vice, vice the versa is not. Um, so an S1 means self. It's when you take a, essentially take a clone of, another, uh, of a single plant. You take two clones, you reverse one using any number of methods to, to cause it to show male flowers. You pollinate another clone of itself and harvest the resulting seeds. That would be a self-generation. Um, good examples of a self-generation would be like the, the Chem 91 S1s from CSI, um, the heirloom Afghani S1s that I did. Um, 
and, and essentially it, you do get to see the recessives despite it being selfed. So a lot of people like to compare sub, the S1 generation to the F2 generation because you're mm -hmm. seeing the recessives. However, you're still narrowing stuff down while seeing the recessives in an S2, whereas in an F2, that's not necessarily what's happening all the time. You meant S1, right? Not S2. Yeah. 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 Uh, God, that's um, going to suck. <laughs> it's going to get these. Yeah, well. I was going to say as well, while you are also likely to find recesses in your S1s, you also have a chance of finding things very much like the plant you're reversing. You have a Is chance to find things very similar. Um, a lot of people understand it to mean that you're going to find exact copies of, and that's, that's definitely not the case. Um, but you'll find things very similar, and some may look identical, you know, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's an exact genetic copy. I mean, it's worth saying this, right? Like any any seeds that you make, regardless of how you make them, you will never ever get genetically identical progeny. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's like this with humans. When I impregnate yeah. myself, <laughs> the resulting babies don't look like me. I've tried this, and it doesn't work very well. I I, I struggle to imagine what they would look like. But... Beautiful though, they're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Right, this one's okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, and also, you know, uh, worth mentioning, we have obviously addressed reversals, uh, and not just reversals. We've addressed selfing quite a bit. So, yep. if you want to hear more about it, definitely reference the last two episodes. We we talk yeah. about selfing in both of them, and the next set of examples, the S twos. S twos. Um, trying to think, you know, actually. I, as I gave an example for S1, for the Chem91 S1s, more than likely uh, those are actually S2s. Yes, um, I wanted to point that out too. So I, I think while it is a great example of like a, a release of an S1, I probably should have referenced something like Jesus. Not even, I was thinking Jesus S1s, but that's probably an S2 too. So it's like, there's a lot of things out there from clones that we buy as S1s that might be S2s, but because... Uh, history hasn't quite proven out that out to be fleshed out like for sure. They're mm -hmm. labeled as what we know them to be, which would be the first true self generation that we can prove, right? So that's in that case they would be referred to as S ones. But in theory, some of that stuff is S twos. And as a good example, probably Ken ninety one because it's so uniform as an S one is a good example of why it is probably an S two. But you don't see a lot of real S twos being released or sold. Um, so that's why I'm kind of stretching it a bit to try to find something that really fits in right there. I think there's there, there's a cool general point in there though, which is that if you don't know what you're starting with, you, what you what your like um, starting material actually is, what generation it actually is, uh, the best you get in cannabis land is a relative kind of designation. So a reboot. In not knowing what the Chem ninety one actually is. All we can say when you self is that it is an S1, quote unquote. But in actuality, it may be an S2. But, you know, because we and don't that, know. It's... And, and in reference to that, the blue bonnet itself was supposed to be a, a blueberry pure line worked, you know. Uh, and if you go by who had it, you know, DJ Short, I think to Vic High, or to Tony from Sigur Matha, to Vic High, to Lone Star, to me, that's a lot of generations that were worked in there. I mean, DJ released it at F4. And supposedly, uh, you know, I mean, there's many generations in there. So it's, it's really mm -hmm. hard to say on that, like, what generation it really and, was. Yeah. Yeah. And coming back to the S2s, um, has our old mate Caleb done S2 work? Or is he? I know he's talked about it before. Yeah, he has, but it's not often released. So it's kind of hard to reference yeah. it. But yeah, there's been there's been several things he's done to, and taken to S3 where the the population of seeds seems to just be unviable. Like they don't pop at S3. Um, I don't oh, think wow. that's always the case, but it has happened. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. All right. Next one is the F1R. F1R. What, what is, so, yeah, what is that? That's a designation that we use in cannabis specifically. And it's only to right. denote reversal. So that when us as breeders, and, and like this is not 
science talk now. This is like yeah. for sure mm -hmm. our own nomenclature that we instituted, right? So it's it's so when breeders are looking at stuff, we know if we're referencing if I'm looking at someone's writing, I know if they're referencing a male in their line or if they're referencing a reversal in their line by that designation. So it's something that we started doing so that we know in each other's work what we're referring to if we're going to work with each other's work. And hopefully more people will institute it over time because it's very helpful and it's important and it gets more and more important as more people come in. I mean, just as important as trying to illustrate that you put the male second, you know, you never put the male first. It always comes yeah. after the female, but even that isn't like strictly adhered to that I see in cannabis. But I mean, we're trying to institute some things to make it more um, easier to read more legible, scientifically legible for all of us. Well, yeah, um, I mean, when it, you have a consistent set of terms, that makes it actually possible to communicate effectively with other people. Yeah, and exactly. And not in not having that, I mean, that's how we got here, right? We're, we're right, in a messy, right. the messy state that we're in right now. Um, and while and, you, well, what Matt's saying is true, it's technically not part of, say, the Mendelian science. It's correct. still very important to designate in the discourse of practitioners, right? right? In the community of, of practitioners. So, yeah. Yeah, cannabis is so different than a lot of other plants. And because it's been kept out of the science room for so long due to its illegal classification, a lot of us were the ones trying to write this stuff and understand it from a point of view of people who were not collegiate, you know, but just trying to do the best we can with what we had. And um, it's interesting is that runs headlong into science and trying to adopt that in, and seeing, how, seeing if they even give a shit on anything we've done, which is not very yeah. likely. Yeah. And it's not an uncommon thing, you know, in other fields of practice, especially ones that are not science-based. Mm -hmm. um, it's still very necessary to come up with your own taxonomy um, instead of terms for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So and, good um, a good example of an F1R would be when we had the sour dub and we reversed the Jesel to it. Um, Jesel and sour dove are not directly related. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's it, it made for amazing progeny. It, and we find that that, that happens a lot. Um, Rascal, OG Rascal made his career making a lot of uh, like reverse hybrids, re reverse feminized hybrids like that. Some of the best earliest fem reverse feminized hybrids were his. So yeah, and, mm -hmm. um, modern times we have Canarado doing great stuff with that as well. Yeah, and um, I would say that F1Rs are very common, right? Yeah, for, very, very for common. market now. Yeah, especially now. Cool. Okay. Um, next one, the BX or BC, Backcross. Okay, Backcross. So we did touch on this last week. Yes. But yeah. And it's, it's essentially um, just taking, trying to think of how to word this best. To, how did I word it last week? I can week? do this one. Because I think yeah, I can you still want to. remember it pretty well. Yeah. So the goal of a back cross is you are trying to bring in one stable trait into an already stable parent. Uh, that parent is called the recurrent parent. It's the one that you are back crossing to. Um, and you have the introgressive parent, which is the one that you're trying to take that one trait from. That was really good. <laughs> That was really good. I'm impressed. Um, <laughs> yeah. So an example of a uh, back cross one would be something like, uh, let's see, what would be a good BX one to use as an example? I, I don't want to keep using blue bonnet. So I'm going to switch it up and go to like uh, our strawberry cream. Strawberry cream was a uh, line developed by CBF, worked several generations and was pretty close to to breeding true, especially with the clone we had. Even when we outcrossed it, strawberry was very dominant. And that was the trait we wanted to lock in. Um, we knew that we, we happened to have been growing Santa Cruz Blue Dream right next to it and noticed that they were very similar. The Santa Cruz Blue Dream was a uh, female. And at this point, I wanted to have a regular seed line of strawberry cream. And CBF had gone, taken a hiatus, and I didn't have any regular seeds of it. So... We took a male Johnny Blaze, which was a blueberry Neville's haze, which is similar to the uh, blueberry super silver haze that was used for Santa Cruz Blue Dream. And we outcrossed that and then brought it back to the strawberry, uh, or that cross 
we brought back to the strawberry cream clone and it produced consistent strawberry turds. So that would be an example of an effective uh, back cross swap. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And the final one that we wanted to touch on for this uh, warm up was an in cross. Are you breeding okay. between two different filial generations, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not dissimilar to a back cross in many ways. Um, a back cross is an example of an in cross. However, usually an in cross is referred to in cannabis specifically. And again, this is one of those, the, the nomenclature from cannabis um, mm -hmm. is referring to like taking uh, an F4 and crossing it back to the F2 generation, a, a selection from the F4 generation. And uh, let's say you have traits you like that are showing up in an F4 male, but you had an F F2 female that you really liked um, that in that case, you would use the F4 male and the F2, and that would be considered an in-cross. Um, an example of this, uh, we had DJ Short's Blueberry. Um, seed line. And we had a selection from it that was very blueberry, but very modern DJ shorts blueberry, which to me means um, like the the butthole terps, like the nasty terps <laughs> with um, slight berry, but very beautiful to look at purple, um, short squat indica. And we crossed that to the blue bonnet, which is, in my opinion, a hybrid of blueberry, but very, very dominant for the blueberry terps. And so in doing this, my goal was to make one that looked like DJ's modern line that had the smell of everything everybody wants from Blueberry and a much stronger high. And um, in order to do that, I did a what we called an in-cross because that's the best way we could define it. As Since it was given to me as a pure Blueberry line, even though my, my suspicions are that it's, the bonnet is not, because it was given to me as that, I, I have to consider it an in-cross. Because I don't want to just like say that I know something that someone else is saying is incorrect, but I don't have proof. I think that's a really good example. Um, could I press you to generalize and tell us like what are the overall benefits of using this method? I mean, the overall benefits are if you're not seeing certain traits pop up in the F2. Let's say you run a population of the F2 generation. You don't see anything in the males mm -hmm. from that generation that you necessarily like. But you've already like you've already taken things generations out. Like in, in High and Lonesome's example, or, or in his case, he has his Appalachia, and he worked that to, I think, F5, F6, and then didn't like necessarily what he was seeing. So he went back, popped more F2s. And at this point, if he doesn't find anything in, you know, in those F in that F2 realm that he liked, he could have popped some of the F6, look for a male on there showing the traits that he liked and use that and hope that it bred like he liked. Wow, that's super interesting. I don't think I've actually um, thought about this that much, this this particular uh, strategy. Very cool. Yeah. Um, I think that brings us to the end of this little intro section, this little warm up. Yes. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add uh, on any of these, Matt? No, I think that's it. I think that was a, I just wanted to give a quick jaunt with some like examples, hypotheticals, maybe, I don't know. I think that was, I think so. it was really good. Um, All right. And I think in the next section, we're going to take it one step further in terms of uh, examples and scenarios. Okay. And we've got a bunch of questions from the Discord. That's right. Um, we are going to begin with Scruston Scarecrow. Type, so he's got a... <laughs> he's got a keeper triangle choke individual. And um, in his words, it brought the best traits from each of the parents, heavy amount of high quality resin, and a nice high from the TK, great blueberry flavor from the bonnet, Jeezel bringing great flower structure, um, and also um, augmenting the smell and flavor. So he doesn't want to use this keeper and crosses yet as he's scared to lose that particular combination of traits. Yeah, and what right. he's thinking about is going through more packs to find another similar individual to the keeper that he's got and maybe doing a sibling cross or maybe an F2R. Now, wh what do we think about his proposed approach if his goal is to produce more homogenous stock that represents his keeper. So there's a few steps to this that I, that I would ask him first. And it would be, are you sure that this mm -hmm. is the ultimate expression from that line that you want to see? 
Like, is it as extreme blueberry? Is it as potent? Is it as resinous mm. as you want? And I've seen, I've seen examples of this and it's, over, it's fucking, it's an amazing example. So in this case, knowing what his example is, I'd say, go ahead, pop more seeds and look. And if you don't see something immediately in there, um, that you that you think can be cloned and and you know grown more and then and might compete or be better i would not do any of those and i would probably not cross it and i would uh i would probably self it i mean if you wanted to have a uniform homogenous line of that specific expression taking it through the generations through regular seeds would be a little bit trickier because you're going to have to pick a male that lines up with a lot of those traits, or you're just going to be constantly, constantly like taking a step back, taking, you know, two steps back, one step forward, two steps back, one steps forward. Um, it's very easy to have that happen, especially with a line that is um, a polyhybrid mm -hmm. like that. So I really recommend selfing for that example, and it'll take it more homogenous, quicker in the direction he wants. And um, you won't have to pop as many, to really keep narrowing it down. Yeah. Yeah. So I was also wondering if he did make S1s. And OK, let's say that he did pop out a few more from these other packs that he's got. Yeah. And he did find another similar individual. Is there anything else he can do with that to help this kind of homogenization or is that just not ultimately going to be helpful? Like, could he self both and then cross the S ones? Like, you know, what, what does that do? So the only way that I would recommend, only reason I would recommend that is if he found another one that say had such like drastic potency, but was equal in smell and resin production to the one that he was keeping, but it was drastically mm -hmm. more potent, but, or maybe it was slightly less smelly. Than the other one but along the same lines and maybe slightly less resinous but along the same lines but close in that case I, like i could understand crossing the two to try to absorb one of the traits and not wear out the other two but even that's still just i mean you're still risking just opening it up again right like yeah so i mean i would still probably just s1 the, the best of the two you know or yeah. the best of the five or however many of the keepers are very similar or or what have you cool yeah okay and he's got a follow-up and yeah. this one is a bit broader um he's asking i think he's asking you in particular because obviously you know the parents and he's he's wondering like do you have a sense of what would outcross well um to his his triangle choke individual yeah. i think so okay he does say something he says um yeah matt having experience with the parents and having actually sampled it are there types that might play well with it, i.e. Um, other plants that may not dominate um, but would still complement it well? Yeah. So this is like a lot of the reason I was doing some of the blueberry or the blue bonnet like um, hybrid cross work, like where I was taking um, the, the blue bonnet Skittles that we had made and crossing it to the, the blue Mac one that we made. Um, crossing the punchy blooster to the, the silver pearl blue bonnet, the cream that we made to try to see how those two cross together. And every single time it seems to be moving forward the, the blueberry turps very heavily, except for in the, um, in the silver pearl one, the silver pearl tended to dominate mostly, but the berry still moves forward. Like you can still find them in there. It's just not as dominant as the silver. With that said, like, I really think like the first thing that comes to my mind, if you don't have any males that you like, um, they immediately show all the traits. Like I said, that's really hard to select for and to know if you don't know the line real well. Um, things like the white bonnet complement that real well because it'll keep the resin production, the potency. And the males from that, I've already found males that are dominant for the, the blueberry scent expression and, and flavor. So I know that it can dominate the white. Things like that immediately come to mind. But Again, that's bringing in more genetics. That's bringing in more outside genetics. But if you're, you're like, if you're insisting on having a regular seed line, I would either use the triangle choke male and really hope for it there. Or if you're trying to drive in the blueberry turps, which I know he really wants to do, I would use something like another bonnet hybrid mm -hmm. of the same line, like I said, or something like the white bonnet. 
I don't think I knew you. You had a white bonnet. Just saying. Yeah, I didn't really sell them much. I, I just passed them out. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. I think that is more or less Scruston's question. Um, is there anything else you would recommend or want to add to his kind of set of parameters or? No, I mean, I is there any, any other kind of like weird paths you could go down for fun or like? I mean, it, you can always try the mail selection. Like I said, it's, it's, I recommend yeah. everybody do it because that's the way you learn the line. Try it. Yeah. Um, but other than yeah. that, like selfing, because I know his goal and what he wants to do, it's hard to recommend him to do anything else or because I know exactly what he wants to get done with it. And it's a great yeah. cut, like of, of all the, um, the stuff people have sent me in, like that's one of the ones that made me sleep, like hardcore put me out. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Very nice. Okay. So I think we can move on to our next question. And this one's from Kyle Terrell. Okay. He has a pack of banana tie us once. And maybe before we go any further, would you like to tell us what the banana tie is? Okay. So the banana tie was a juicy fruit tie that came from a local place. And uh, I, when I picked it up, it was, a, it was a local club. And I just thought there was no way. I thought there was no way that these people would, know, one, know what a tie was. Well, what juicy fruit tie was. Um, but it did look very quote unquote, sativa, typically sativa. So I took it home and it was definitely a Thai dominant plant that had been worked. Um, probably, I, I, my best guess would be Sensi Seeds type juicy fruit Thai. Um, and it smelled like juicy fruit gum. Um, it could be taken anywhere between 11 to 14 weeks, depending on where, where people take it, like where they like it. But it was explosively speedy hide. It is not, not play around happy tie weed like i assumed it would be it is very potent and uh the banana tie was that cross to our platinum banana og bx1 mail very cool okay so continuing on with kyle's question he's got two keepers of uh his banana tie us once um one keeper has a no ceiling high the juicy fruit smell and taste but poor structure yeah the second keeper has better structure and yield uh, tropical fruit and banana terps, but a lower ceiling for the high, which he doesn't like. Yeah. And so what he's hoping is to bring the structure and yield from the second one into the first one. And what he's thinking about, so that's the goal, right? And what he's thinking yeah. about doing is reversing and then combining the two keepers in both ways, and then maybe also selfing each of them to look through. That's, yeah. I mean, that's great. That's actually a really good example, I think, of of how to do that, how to, how to yeah. lock in both traits. And um, that line's a hard one. That line's a really tough one because it uses, it, it incorporates banana OG. And I've talked about banana OG a little bit in the past on the show, but mm -hmm. in banana OG, there are some beautifully banana smelling stuff. There's some beautifully OG Kush smelling stuff. Um, there's combinations of both. And then there's like the 60% ratio clip of just, Blando skunk one just mm. bland bland i mean it's it's got a decent high but it's just so bland that it's not really super appealing to anyone um not super resinous super bland um in the juicy fruit tie in the outcrosses there is a lot of that too um, there's low odor um low terp like just semi-sweet plants in there but they're like that clone example just ripping and it has a beautiful smell so in that banana tie, I knew there would be stuff that would be variant. And I knew it would have a, like what we talk about, a high ceiling, low floor, as far as mm -hmm. what to expect, not necessarily high, mm -hmm. but what to expect from the, the progeny. Um, so I ended up giving them away for the most part. Um, but then the demand got pretty big. So we auctioned off a few after a few years of it being out. But in the S1s, um, we used really good examples of it. So in the S1s, it, it should be easy enough to do like uh, sister crosses of the S ones and lock in some traits that way. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. I guess it'll also be interesting to see how easy it will be or not to, to reverse some of these as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause you just never know. You never know what's going to drop pollen or not. I should point out by the way, that uh, we did not 
uh, manipulate people into using Matt's work for any of these questions. That is just, you know, <laughs> we're all from this, like, we're all from the small community. And so, you know, people are growing, uh, a lot of people are growing Matt's work. And, and that's why that's how, it that's how it we're goes. We're not doing some kind of like uh, underhanded <laughs> marketing, although I think Matt will still take it. Yeah, I'll take it. I mean, you know, we can do a contest if people want to, but yeah. I feel like um, organizing contests online must be really difficult. So. It's so hard, man. It's just like even doing like the small giveaway contests, like on IG, we found that like yeah. there was almost no way to do it without a second person immediately complaining that they won. Like we just never had it happen <laughs> without that happening. It was, it was crazy. It was like immediately we're in kindergarten. They're like, ah, I was first. I was first. It was on my screen first. You know, so it's hard. It's like hurting cats. Yeah. I think even like uh, uh, even more complicated, like the idea of like trying to run like a little like mini cup, you know, and yeah. like Ooh. getting samples sent around and just thinking about all the different steps in the logistics and how much could go wrong at every step yeah. and like yeah. not being able to guarantee like much really. Um, but I remember I know, um, maybe... one of the Adam Dunn cups, one of my friends mailed in his example and it got it got stuck at the post office and we didn't know why we did not have a clue why we just knew that we had to go there and pick it up at the post office and he had to pre present his id to do it and i remember looking i'm like are you gonna really come do this like as we pulled up the post office like is it really worth it like we don't know why they're keeping it it turned out they were keeping it because it was like short a dollar like on postage but like <laughs> it was one of those things where like you, you really think they're going to give you your fucking lead back, bro? So, yeah, there's all kinds of things that can go crazy with those competitions. Just that alone, you know? Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> I mean, I, would, I, I wouldn't I would mind seeing someone try, but I, I'm not going to. I don't think I'm going to get involved. <laughs> yeah. No, it was wild. All right. Well, okay. So we've got another question from Scientist. And um, this one, my apologies. I don't know. I, I hope I've interpreted his question correctly. There are quite a few uh, moving parts to his one, so I'll, I'll do my best. So his story is, he was given some seeds a few years ago, um, a set of blueberry seeds from one of his friends. Um, okay. And I believe he said it was from the 90s. Um, so he's essentially wanting to extend his buddy's blueberry work um, and see what kinds of traits exist in this lineage that his friend has been working with. Okay. Um, and part of the way that he wants to learn about them is by crossing them to other, other lines. So yeah. in addition to his friend's 90s blueberry seeds of unknown, relatively unknown um, provenance, he's got a Bonnet F2 pack. I think, according to what he's saying, he has two different pre-98 Bubba cuts, maybe? And he's also yes. got some pea berry. Yeah. So what he's trying to do, just to say again, he wants to try them out in different combinations to learn more about his buddy's blueberry that he, he was given. Um, that's his initial question. Okay. Um, is that a question? I think so. <laughs> Uh, like, I think what he's trying to ask is like, do these crosses make sense? Like, so with okay. the bottom F2, uh, okay. what can he, what could he possibly learn doing it gotcha. this way? So, um, he listed a few different Bubba clones, right? And that, and yeah, that's right. he listed that he was growing Bonnet F2s as well. Bonnet F2s. And I think he said pea berry, which is the katsu pea bubba berry. blue bonnet. And I think he said the pre-98 bubba blue bonnet, which is the blubba kush. I and see. you can learn about all of those. I mean, if he knows bubba really well, those are excellent ways to figure out what's going on with his homies uh, blueberry. First, if it's related to DJ's blueberry is, is a good question. Is it, is it related to DJ's blue? Run it, run it out. Um, Mm -hmm. run out a bunch of these these blue bonnet f2 see if anything's lining up at all see if there's any traits lining up um and if he knows bubba really well like finding those bubba blue bonnets are so stable um um expression wise that like right, they're a great cross to, to outcross to anything to bring in potency and blueberry terps i know um mm -hmm. sub rob 
from San Diego's finest cuts is it's one of his more favorite lines is the blubber Kush for that reason for male selection and breeding. So mm. yeah, and I know. I, I think it's a good way to learn. I mean, like to, to learn about it. And if he knows Bubba, those lines will tell him more, you know? Yeah. And just to clarify as well, I imagine uh, just to leave like no stone unturned, so to speak, I imagine what he is going to do is actually first run all those things out separately. Right. Like, yeah, he's not just going to like immediately cross them all, yeah, and then try to figure out what's going on because that would be pretty crazy. I yeah, imagine. that'd be yeah, yeah. So that's not the way. Uh, the way is to run each of these uh, packs, lines, uh, cuts out, look at them all separately, and then maybe after that you can try like crossing some of them and yeah. see what passes. And uh, like those lines are great if he knows Bubba. Yeah. It's like it's really easy to pick out the Bubba traits from the blue bonnet ones to me but i know bubba really really well so that's why you sorry you may have actually covered this but his follow-up was would the pea berry help or would it just confuse things and slow slow things down his goal is not to make seed for production but just learn about that blueberry strain um so anything you want to say about the pea berry in particular the only difference between the pea berry and like the pre-98 bubba from shaw is that the pea berry, I think that that katsu bubba is a hybrid of bubba. So it is different than bubba kush traditional. It's beautiful. Okay. It's purple. Um, but it is slightly different. So I think that's, I mean, if you know the katsu cut, it's still very bubba-ish, but it has different, like the way the bud formations are is different typically than, bu than bubba kush, but the chirps are very similar. It goes from that coffee um chocolatey coffee to to the soapy cushy depending on how you grow it i mean mm -hmm. it's it's very similar i think both are really good um directions it, it it's so dominant bub is so dominant in katsu that you know a lot of people would argue whether it's a hybrid or not but i'm pretty sure it is okay um i've got he actually i didn't see this but he actually had another point that's kind of a wrench uh to okay. this plan in my opinion and maybe it was good that I skipped over it, but now he's now I've noticed he said he's limited to six flowering plants per run. Yeah, well, I mean, you could do it. It's just going to take a long time. Be patient. So how how, how would he how would he approach that? Just kind of do it in parts, right? Like you know, yeah, just yeah, in parts and keep a lot of clones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can relate. I can relate, buddy. Like, yes, yeah. it's, it's not easy. <laughs> No, it's not. not. It just takes time. Yeah. Okay. So anything else you want to add to this whole enterprise of like, or do you think we've covered enough uh, for scientists' questions? I just, I just really like it because like um, one of the initial things that I was running were the Bubba Blue Bonnets, the White Bonnets, and a few others. They're basically Afghani-dominant Blue Bonnet crosses. Um, that was where I wanted to initially take a lot of the lines because itself bonnet is very traditionally cushy afghani dominant so mm. it's a good it's a good partner for it essentially so yeah I, I like his idea i think the other thing i like about this question is that in some ways he's actually not really that concerned about making seeds or or um breeding per se in this one scenario he's actually just talking about wanting to learn as much as possible yeah which we did talk about last week as being extremely important and like it's also extremely time consuming and um, resource is. intensive. So it is admirable. I think that someone Very. is like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not actually about seed making right away. I actually just want to learn. Um, and that's quite rare. <laughs> there is, there is one thing I'll add to this. And it's just the, the one thing from the past two shows that I've noticed in the comments that nobody like, maybe they have, maybe I haven't communicated it well, but mm -hmm. the playing, when I refer to playing, which is crossing mm -hmm. unknown to unknown or, or known to known and just seeing what happens. While I say that's not breeding, it is an, um, it is an essential part yes. to learning to breed. It is, you yeah. can't really breed if you don't know what you have, like in my mm -hmm. opinion. And it is a, an essential step, but it's not breeding proper because you're not doing necessarily uh, having goals with selection. You know, it's like not goal. There's not an, an end goal here. We're just seeing what happens and learning. But learning is a part of it. 
you have to do that. It's a major step. So I don't want to discount that part as part of breeding. It's a major part of it, but it's not breeding proper, if, if that makes any sense. I, yeah, I, I, I think I can, I can that. paraphrase that, um, which is do. that um, the seeing what shit sticks vibe is an important part of breeding, but breeding itself is not reducible to that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I, I yeah. want to make that clear because it sounds like, like I'd see people's comments saying, no, it's important. I'm like, I never said it wasn't. It's totally important. I spent most of my career doing that, you know, like that's, that's, <laughs> You know, I'm not, I can't shit on that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, I think when people hear someone uh, putting conditions around something, um, it does like uh, some people can be quick to assume that that means that they just shouldn't do it, but that's yeah. not that's often not the case. Often, what all we're just saying, all we're saying is we're pointing out the limits of something. Uh, there is never just like something is, is outrightly good or outrightly bad or outrightly useful or outrightly not useful. Yeah. Each each thing, each technique, each strategy has its own trade-offs and limits. Yeah. yeah, each strategy is good for looking at the... Types. Female types. Female types. There we go. Oh, uh, we really need to get some not so... Um, yeah, we do. ...soundboarding <laughs> stuff going yeah. If any of you guys out there get bored and hear this and want to make little MP3 clippies of the best Natsoisms, I'll toss them up on the soundboard for sure. Oh, that's a really good idea. Community, yeah. please get on it. Help with that. Um, I help just did some. It. If I had like another couple of hours, I might have tried to get some. But yeah, someone else, please do it. Yeah, there's a few I want to okay. grab. <laughs> um, we could also put his face on the screen while we're playing those. Um, oh yeah, I could just make a not so mask and wear it. That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. Maybe for Halloween, I'll make him one for me, and I'll we'll play each other. <laughs> we should do yeah, a Halloween impression of me. Yeah, we should. That would be yeah, funny. Make him okay. do imitations of me and me of him. He has brutal, I if brutal he could... imitations of me, dude. Brutal. I really? I was actually going to say I didn't think not so was like would would be down would is like the you know that he could do impersonations necessarily you know, i don't know why but that's cool to hear that he, he can yeah I, i'm not saying they're accurate but it's more the things that he thinks i would say that are fucking <laughs> <brutal. laughs> yeah it's mm -hmm. worth it all right all right let's get back to the questions shall we yeah um okay we've got a pretty Pretty good and open one from Quasia. He's actually got a couple, but we'll start with this okay. one. So he, these are hypotheticals. I don't know if he, I assume that he's thinking about this, but he's not actually started on anything yet. Okay. Um, he says, so let's say he starts with a pack of fem seeds and he has a few possibilities here. One is CSI's Big Bad Wolf. I think that is the Chem D N91. Is that, okay. if I'm not mistaken. There's a TKS ones. Or he says one of the recent LA Kush headband hybrids. Okay. So starting with one of these, what steps would you take to get a male with as many traits from the fem pack as possible? And the follow-up being, would the starting fems change the process? And if so, how? Um, yes. So they're all different from each other, each step in that. The Chem D, Chem 91 would definitely be different from um, a TKS1 selection since they are variant mm -hmm. TKS ones. His selection would definitely matter. I mean, some are creamy, some are not like OG Kush at all. Some are very mm -hmm. OG Kush type, you know? Um, and what was the last one? Uh, it was one of the recent LA Kush headband crosses from Not So and CSI. Okay, so mostly like diesel, super skunk type hybrids were in there, most of them. Though some were like Bubblegum and Bubba Kush or Mendo Perps that were very different. So it really does depend on what the starting material is before we can dive okay. into the males. But let's assume let's assume he's um, wanting to do Pick diesel one. types. Yeah. Diesel types. Yeah. Um, or actually, no, let's go Chem just because he went with Chem 91. Chem D is the first one. Let's do that. And sure. assume he wants to go for Chem uh, types. What? Where would he go for a male for that? So, you know, it just depends on the area you're from and the stuff you have access to. Like, 
I would immediately, for any kind of regular chem breeding hybrid, I would immediately think of uh, Matt Elite's work with the, um, the, the Chem 91, Chem D I-95 specifically. I-95. Mm -hmm. It was just so heads and tails above any other regular chem work done by me, done by anyone else that I've ever seen. It was just so precise to Chem 91, and I don't know how he did it. Um, it was just really lucky and good. Not just lucky, but it was, he knows chems really well. And some of it was luck, but it was good selection. You know what I mean? Like it had Legend OG in there. It had Stardog, it had Triangle, it had all that stuff in the I-95. And then you add in Chem 91 and Chem D, which are two different plants. Um, but knowing that and knowing that it's very Chem 91 dominant, I would definitely advise Quasia to probably track something down similar to that. Um, it's tracking down chem stuff takes knowing really reliable sources of it. And there's only a yep. few people I trust <laughs> on earth with chem stuff to know what it is, to know that they don't have fake cuts, to know that they never got fake cutted, any of that. Um, there's only a few people that I trust for that. And I don't want to sh throw people under the bus, so I'm not going to name all of them, but I really like Matt Elite stuff too. Nice. Nice. And I think that, that work of his is pretty pervasive now. You still see it used quite a bit, don't yeah. you? I, yeah, some people have it. Um, we He never sold it, ever. Mm. He let people have it. And if they were doing auctions for like charities or whatever, if there was homies doing auctions, he would toss them in. And he gave me a bunch to like sell and toss, toss in for freebies. Um, so they made it out there, but like not everybody picked him up. So no, that, I mean, people use them, but they're not as pervasive as they once were. I mean, uh, I know Dynasty uses it. I use it and that's about it that I know of right now. Okay, just for fun and for the sake of it, would you would you be keen to then now move to like, say he's starting with the TKS1s and think about what mail would work for that? So a lot of wedding cake stuff pops up in that um, TKS1s. When I say wedding cake type stuff, that means stuff that is like kind of creamy meh terps to me. And just very resinous, very productive, very dense. Um, you can find that in, let's see, what's a good one? Bodhi's um, Love Triangle is a good example. Um, you can, like mm -hmm. that, that triangle, 88G13 hash plant. Though a lot of people thought that the 88G13 hash plant was too dominant in it for a uh, triangle Kush type back cross, it would be a great one, I think. And keep nice. the. Um, Maybe hopefully help with the wedding. I don't know if it'll help with the wedding cake terms, but but it might. It might. Dude, well, you weren't joking when you said you could just do this off the top of your head, eh? Um. <laughs> I, I did it for so long on Instagram every night for hours. You're doing free consultations for people. Yes, yeah, free always, always free <laughs> for the peeps. Okay, all right. Well, how about now starting with the LA? Let's assume it's going to be a diesel type cross um you know what let's throw a wrench in that let's do let's not do a diesel type cross let's do mm -hmm. well i know you know what yeah let's do a diesel type cross because that's just going to be so dominant <laughs> there because it, it wouldn't make sense i was going to say let's do like mendo perps or like bubble gum maybe but i don't think that's mm -hmm. going to necessarily dominate i think a lot of the bubble gum when it does it's just earthy and not bubble gum smelling so um diesel let's do diesel so again, diesel is a hard one because yes, there's so few indeed. people I would trust to know diesels. Um, for regular diesel lines, god damn, that's a hard. Yeah, one. there are many. I, I don't know if I can think of them easily. I'm trying. I'm trying to do stuff that's not blue bonnet related or blue bonnet adjacent, and I'm trying to think of other people who make regular seed lines of diesel that I would highly recommend that I know for sure are using good diesels. Um, I know Chaco's um, let some of his sour crosses out. Those are great. Um, um, I'm sure there's some. It just really takes a lot of research, and I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. And then there's certain people I would recommend that just don't deserve it because they've been pricks lately. So I'm okay. trying to think. How about this? How about this, man? Make it a bit easier. What if you didn't have to find another? What if you couldn't? Let's just say you couldn't find a diesel male or mm -hmm. diesel type kind of regular line, what other line would you go to if you could have? Um, 
So I would recommend super skunk. So look for like a Jeezel regular seed hybrid. And now there are those out there um, from yeah. other people besides myself. And it's not too super rare to find. Just avoid um, anyone with 420 in their username because usually <laughs> those people have fake Jeezel cuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to be clear, because Matt's being a bit... Um, Matt's being it's a bit just... coy, but he, Matt has a bunch of like regular Jeezel crosses. So yeah, yeah. There, and yeah, possible. other people do too, but yeah, there, there's definitely out there. Okay. And it's an excellent super skunk type and sours a super skunk and Jeezel is more like, um, more like diesel than it is like a chem in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. So within, I guess within, within this, uh, project like in terms of steps you know are there any particular kinds of steps you would recommend him taking or um you know since it's all regular reading i i would really recommend um back crossing one time for the trait that he wants and then working it forward pick a yeah. trait start with the trait you know pick a trait um you can't have it all sometimes i mean i shouldn't say you can't have it all sometimes you get it all very rarely yeah. do you get it all, but sometimes but you get managing your expectations, managing your expectations. Knowing the odds. Because, I mean, that did throw me a bit when he said, um, what did he say? He said, uh, with as many traits from the fem pack as possible. Like, that's an interesting qualifier for me where I'm yeah. like, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get good breeding work done in the pack that you receive, right? Like the blue bonnet was red to go. Um, yeah. CSI does great work. So sometimes you'll get, you know, it'll be that easy. Um, lots of times it's pick a trait and stick with one because that's that's the best you could hope for. Um, but yeah. but yeah. it happens. Yeah. So I think there's a difference between something unlikely occurring and you planning your process relative to what is likely to happen. Um, and yeah. if you are planning your process likely to what is uh, <laughs> planning your process relative to what is likely, then you should try to focus on like a single trait um, at each step because you're, you're you're reducing the odds. I mean, sorry, you're you're helping your odds. I think I had a, was trying to make a point of that last week. Yeah. I had a really really skewed understanding of breeding, how it worked, how traits work, what a phenotype was, all that coming up. I didn't have anybody to teach me specifics on that. I didn't really, like, I didn't go to college for this. I didn't pay attention in high school to botany. I just didn't care, like, about any of that shit, right? So I had to learn as it went. And it just, none of that stuff comes common sense. Uh, that's the one thing we've been trying to drive home is, like, it, Murphy's Law plays out heavy sometimes. You know, expect the worst to happen. And, like, I, I ran into a lot of Murphy's Law on my way up. That doesn't mean everybody does. But I did. So that's why I always like have these qualifiers of like, you know, this is that I try to give the worst case scenario on what to expect, because sometimes that's just how it plays out. I mean, I felt like in some ways, and I know I'm being uncharitable about our content, but in some ways I saw last week's episode as just an extended fucking disclaimer, you know, in a yes. way. Yes. Um, I don't be. think that's inaccurate. Yeah, because some of this kind of thinking is not intuitive, as you were saying, like people are becoming accustomed to how you deal with probabilistic outcomes that may not be intuitive. Yeah. Um, using terms like low floor, high ceiling, those are terms that you use around probability and how you think about probability. That's a good point. Um, and when you are dealing with prob uh, probability, it's not enough to just say, well, it can happen. It's like, yes, any of these outcomes are possible, but it doesn't mean that they are probable. So just because it happened for you once doesn't mean that it's repeatable and that it can be consistent. You might just have been extremely, extremely lucky. Like uh, in the chat yesterday in Discord, in the, in the voice chat, people were talking about their positive experiences with pollen chucking, um, like in the open, yeah. like hitting ran not hitting random branches and you know and like hey, i can do this it's nothing big you know i did it you know and it's like just because you were able to do it in the tent with your you know yeah. that one time doesn't mean that you should like make that a habit because <laughs> i yeah. promise it won't yeah. happen that way every time yeah 
I mean, Matt, you and I were chatting a bit about gaming, which I don't think we've ever done before, uh, before yeah. we started recording. And it th- it kind of comes to mind for me in in the in the world of games as well, where you might make a ridiculous move that works for you that one time. Yes. But if you do it a hundred times, it might work like three or four times or, you know, something, yes. some kind of terrible success rate. And there's a difference between something being reliable and repeatable and something that just worked for you just because it worked for you that one time. Right? Exactly. That's exactly. Yeah. That's, a, that's actually a really good way of saying it and uh, illustrating it. You know, like sometimes I play games and it's like playing with like actual kids and they annoy the shit out of me and and they do something I stupid do and I'm like, you shouldn't have done that. But they're like, but it worked, right? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, but, uh, you know, and then I give up. And then they walk <laughs> outside and get hit by a car. <laughs> and then they're telling me to go touch grass or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I'm old, I know. Oh um, my God, how do you deal with this? How do you deal with them? I cuss, I cuss so much. It'd be so I just have to cover. be like, you don't have a full brain. I'm gonna just forget about what you just said. I just will yeah. ignore you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we can come back to Quasia's second question, which is also quite interesting. Okay. Um, so his hypothetical scenario is finding a plant that has some really unique scents. I think he specified like you know low concentration, high impact scent compounds. But essentially, he's saying he's found if he finds something with a unique scent that he's, I don't know if he's guessing is a recessive trait or if he's maybe discovered that it's recessive or has a uh, premonition that it is, um, but that that scent is otherwise getting lost in the overall like nose of the of the plant, right? And also, mm-hmm. it doesn't translate to flavor. How would he go about breeding? to make that rare scent component more prominent in the overall nose and translate better to flavor. Um, he says, it's fine to bring in other specific flavors as long as the overall package is high flavor and that the original recessive scent com- component, the one that he was talking about at the beginning, um, comes through, ultimately. <sighs> it seems Damn. like a, I think nailing both of those things seems really hard. Maybe even just talking about how you try to get that one draw that one scent out is maybe enough for one part of this question. So like for me, the, when he says like a high impact, low occurrence or whatever high it was. Impact, or, uh, low concentration. Concentration. So like something like a volatile sulfur compound or something that's um, dissipates pretty fast. I would assume is what he's Did you say roadkill? Just kidding. Yeah. Yes. No, no, never. Um, no. Guys. I think that's what he's referring to. Um, and it's probably the example I'll go to on how I tried to do it a few different ways. Um, we had two, what I think were super skunk adjacent lines in, um, like Jeezel and then the heirloom Afghani, which had a lot of, um, typically more sativa expressions, but it is mostly Afghani in structure. And that's what we were told it was. And it, it played out that way, but what most people like, it was more narrow leaf in some expressions. So I think people would typically classify that as sativa, but I, I don't see it as that. But I do think it has super skunk in it or something like that, or, or a similar type of Afghani. In it. Um, so I tried doing S1s of the Afghani. And it had a very, very high volatile sulfur compound. Um, like you could just smell it. Like it was just wild, wild strong. In the outcross is what we saw, or not outcross, I'm sorry, in the self line, what we saw was a lot of variation. Uh, we saw a lot of variation in expression being that it, was, it would go from, because when you would smell it, the, the, the combination of all those smells smelled kind of skunky, but like individually, it would be a combination of like ammonia, piss, you know, um, burnt rubber, tennis ball. Yeah. And then whatever that component is in Jeezel that is skunky, whatever that component is that, that you would describe as that, in super skunk and jeezel and, th- and that kind of type or, or sour even um it had that but in those three combinations together it just smells loud like loud like burn your eyes skunk um but we saw like each of those individual expressions laid out we'd see stuff that was just pissy we'd see stuff that was just uh burnt rubber we'd see stuff that was more like savory skunk but it was really hard to nail the the trifecta of all three in a in a 
very potent mm -hmm. form like the initial mom was yeah. super hard. Um, so I tried that way. And at the same time, at another location, we were doing a Jeezel cross to a, or I'm sorry, a sour dub cross to a reverse Jeezel. And in doing this, I was testing the super skunk, the, the theory that like, if we double up on the super skunk theme, that sour dub has super skunk in it by the sour and um, uh, sour dub, Jeezel. And then Jeezel has super skunk in it, probably being a, a super skunk self line, um, accidental bag seed. And what I found was that more consistently, the skunk spray chem seemed to, and that was the name of the line, um, direct it towards the, the sour dub Jeezel uh, seemed to go more towards keeping it consistently in that super skunk, savory, buttery skunk range and not veering away from it. Whereas the heirloom Afghani S1 would go the pissy range and more the burnt tennis ball range, if that makes sense. So that's how I did it. Um, in approaching that project in, in a similar method. Yep. Now, mm -hmm. moving Terps into it is is really hard. Initially, like when I think of bringing in any kind of Terps to things like extracts, I immediately think of terpinaline because like that terpinaline to me has turned up the volume on most fruity flavors, berry flavors, stuff like that. Um, I don't know that terpinaline, terpinaline would necessarily be a great driver of skunky stuff, but it, it definitely helped in the Fairfax four way. So there's no reason that it couldn't help with this and actually translate it to even more flavor. Um, but terpinaline is known to dominate so heavy. So you'd get a lot of stuff that was only terpinaline with no volatile skunk compound or sulfur compound. And uh, it would take a, a large pop or a lot of luck to find. But that, that would be my first thought. Yeah, very nice. And I think from a theoretical point of view, like uh, like you were saying, it obviously depends a lot on whether or not, uh, in reality, this is actually trying to combine um, a few different traits. Mm -hmm. um, or if it, you know, from, say, like a Mendelian perspective, it literally is a single trait that's recessive. Yep. Then technically, again, in, from a theoretical point of view, if it's a single trait that is recessive, you need to find another plant that, also has that trait that is and also recessive. That's the only way you you'll see much of it. The double it recessive. Yeah. 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 So that's yep. just from the and theory. Like I think Matt did a better explanation of actually practically how you would try to approach it. And that's and but by doing it and everything we've done, and also Caleb with the big bad wolf and other mm -hmm. um other of these chem and super skunk hybrids, we're kind of figuring out, yeah, it seems like that 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 smell in the super skunk lines seems to be a double recessive. It seems to be recessive. And when you, when you do the super, what we call the super skunk double up technically is it, it seems like it is a double recessive and locking it in. And that's why when you do it, it consistently shows. Cool. Very nice. I think that one will be very interesting to a lot of people. <laughs> okay. So um, I actually had a last minute addition. Uh, I don't think I got to go over this one with you, Matt, but I think it's, okay. I think it's pretty reasonable. Um, okay. So it's from Dudeness. Um, he's got a male sour diesel, unknown provenance, so sour diesel, quote unquote. Um, he describes it as being uh, well-structured, sturdy, vigorous, good gassy stem rub. I'm assuming that he doesn't actually no he's he's not run progeny out from it before so just qualify that um, is he flowered he's also got, he's doing stem rubs doesn't specify so no. maybe we can make some assumptions uh, i'm going to assume no okay if you're doing stem rubs you don't you haven't smelled the flower yeah yeah you're, you're probably right um so he's also got two female keepers of limelight um that is key lime pie um by MBBK. Sorry, I'm not as familiar with this one. Um, he says that they don't have the greatest frame, but they grow well, they smell good, pine, skunk, hint of lime. And ultimately what he's trying to achieve, he wants to put a studio frame on the limelight and maybe add a bit more gas to the back end, maybe maintaining or increasing potency. He's made the first cross already. Okay, so I was mistaken. He has made a cross. And he's about to run through the first generation to dig through to see what's being passed. Um, the questions he's got, if I find a male or female keeper in the F1 pop, should I go to F2 as well? Um, 
or should I just try, or what would be the best course to try and lock in those like um, traits that he wants in the cross? Um, so structure is one of the easiest things to breed for. Um, true, that's I mean, a good point. Because I mean, hemp is very has great structure, and that's like cannabis in its real yeah. or in its state, its natural state is hemp. You know, like so. That's true. Um, yeah. Um. So and and when he says it's sour diesel with great structure, I immediately think that's not sour diesel because that's not. And I think he's kind of aware of that. I think he's okay. saying that, like you know, that's what he's calling it, but you know, it's yeah, it's something. It's and, and that and that's typical though. That's not even a, a crack on it because that's that happens a lot. It's a male. How are you going to know? Does. Um, yeah. So I, I guess maybe his male, he wasn't able to get much more than stem rubs off of the smell, which also can happen with males. Um, if he's run through the progeny and he sees what he likes, I mean, I S1 it. There's no reason to F2 it if you've already got everything you like with the structure and the progeny, um, unless you think it's not quite good enough and it's not keeper enough for your taste. Like if you think there's something better in there, then of course you can F2 it, but um again so i think yeah, people have this want to do hmm. oh good good i was gonna say that his extended question was basically like i thought so you may have already answered it he's basically saying yeah how far down the generation should i go and should i like consider back crossing as well kind of thing um i mean like i say people have this want to like work a line or think that they need to work a line but it, it if you've already found what you like there's really nothing else to do with S1 unless you really want a regular seed line of it. I think know, that's but, actually a huge point. Yeah. You don't have to keep working it. You don't have to, you don't need to keep looking if you found like your ultimate keeper that you like, like it nails all the boxes, bam, bam, bam. You can always, like I said, explore, look through the rest and be sure. Like maybe there is something way better that you didn't even know existed. But um, ultimately when you find that one that is a keeper, unless your goal is to have like just a bunch of regular seeds backed up for it. Um, then I just don't know any reason to do anything other than S1 or self it. So a paraphrase of this is work forward. If you are looking for more. Yes. But if you have what you are looking for, then it is less, less reasonable to do that. Yeah. It's just, it, why, why? Yeah. Yeah, from a learning point of view, maybe, but otherwise, yeah, why? It's like when I see BX6 or BX12 <laughs> or F12. Like, if you're doing real selections on this stuff, you should be able to lock it in in four moves. Like, at least the trait that you want or multiple F12? traits. If, if, if be. Yeah, people, dude, bro, people say the craziest shit, dude. Like, people be making seeds for two years and say they're F12, and you're just looking at them like, ha, 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 man, how? I, Dude, I was watching um, I was watching a BBC documentary on the history of apples in Britain. Um, yeah, I'll say first of all, it was the fucking most British thing I've ever seen. Like, it sounds like it, dude. Um, it sounds super British. Uh, it, it was it was actually really cool. Um, and they were talking about what it actually took to develop some of their new varieties, and it was they literally were taking like a decade. Oh yeah, because sometimes they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're waiting for sport mutations, which is like a clonal mutation on a branch to pop up. Like that's, that, that that's just waiting <laughs> on luck to, and nature to take its course and time. Like it, that doesn't, it's a random occurrence, you know, like um, my favorite apples are, what are they called? Mm. Cosmic crunch. I think they're called. And they're a, um, or cosmic crisp. I'm sorry. Cosmic crisp apples. And they are a sport mutation off of, the honey crisp apple and when i first got them i was like fuck i'll just get the seeds out what the hell and then i was like thinking about it. i was like wait a minute i know that that's not quite how it works in apples it's not just mm. like can of seeds you know what i mean so i looked it up and, I, and yeah absolutely if you pop those seeds you may get nothing yeah, remotely even kinds close of, yeah yeah it's a sport mutation so it's not going to occur at all like normally yeah they still rely very much on um on clones as well yeah grafting yeah. And the actually, I'll say this, I think it's, it was, it kind of blew my mind. This was the one part that I wasn't um, expecting at all. They breed rootstocks. Like, oh, yeah, they will, they will have separate kinds of rootstocks and then graft things onto them. And I just didn't somehow, I mean, I knew this was a thing. I know, especially in citrus, it's a thing. But I was just kind of blown away by the idea that like, 
they basically have like a cloned rootstock that they will use. So that mm -hmm. brings the consistency. I actually wonder if, what that would mean in cannabis. Because I know a lot. We do it. Possible. People do it. Oh, we do. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. Like OG Kushes have really, really weak root structure. Who was doing this the other day I was talking to? Someone I was talking to was doing this the other day. Um, oh, I know exactly who it was. Farmer Dan. Um, but he's been working on it with, with some of their stock. And um, yeah, OGs That's have really good. weak root structures and they're known for it. But if you graph that onto something like a bubba that has like really fat root structure, like any any plant. Yeah, bubble any, gum. A fucking hemp cut. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. After yeah, onto yeah, that, yeah. You're, you're fucking solid, bro. You can pound it out with some OG. So yeah. It reminded me of another like quite, one of those like, uh, what am I? one of those weird like peripheral projects that you get to see on the forums um mm -hmm. where it was like basically like rootstock with multiple graphs from multiple different individuals like yeah. onto the one mother mm -hmm. kind of like weird hydra type plant they always have um, those emerald cut bro like the blue dream with og on it and like fucking like nine other clones grafted onto it it's like bizarre novelty plants i guess yeah. like um Kind of cool, I guess. Yeah. I wanted to buy an apple one yesterday. They have a three-in-one apple plant that, or tree that they were selling at Home Depot. That I think, I like, I assume it was grafted. I don't know. How are they also they doing three-in-one? No, it must be. Yeah, it must apple be. trees. But yeah, like, but it was funny because like I'd see some of them that would like look smaller than the others and not be as branchy, and they would they would be advertised as three-in-one, but there would only be two tags showing that like so one of the branches got knocked off. That was a whole other graft. So it was really a two-in-one. <laughs> But they still wanted the same price, obviously. It's Home Depot. I guess the going back to the 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 kind of uh, hydra hydra like multi multi branch multi individual graft thing. I mm -hmm. guess if you were like you live in a prohibition country like me or under prohibition con conditions, and like maybe it would be a very ambitious kind of mother project where you technically would be have one mother plant, but it's actually many plants. Maybe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a, a solution to a lot of people's problems. I think um, you can't keep right. many mothers, keep a monster mom, hydra mom, monster mom. Medusa All right. Mom. Uh, anyone in the discord who's keen, please do it. I want to see it. Um. <laughs> you know, my friend racer X who um, used to be one of my, like, he's, he's still around, but like he was really integral in our company early on. Um, he would do amazing, like graft branch, bra like grafting like monster branches on like tree grafting branches, and he would do like monster clones, like six foot clones, just to see if he could do it. And like air pruning, which is where you know you moisten part of the branch and like cut yes. it a little bit so roots come out, and they would like dip That's down right. and yep. grow into the soil on its own. Like he'd have these monster yeah, air clone, trees yeah. doing that. He had great pictures of doing all this stuff back in the day, but. I haven't seen it done in a while. I mean, I think, I guess the broad, I mean, I know this was just like a fun tangent, but I guess a broad, a broad learning from this for me is like, don't hesitate to look outside of cannabis for examples, for information, for inspiration, because like I pointed out last week, the information space in cannabis is basically like ruined. Yeah. And if you, I mean, apart from us, of course, we're perfect. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but uh, otherwise, if you want to learn about breeding, definitely, like, look at other crops. Like, you know, human civilization has had thousands of years of history of breeding. So there's no reason why we can't learn from other uh, types of agriculture. Absolutely. And, and but one thing I've also learned is um, that, like, in scientific data, specifically, when they are trying to apply, say, hops or hemp, to drug type cannabis, they often do that and don't qualify that, or people don't understand that it really is qualified as another type of this plant. And yeah. um, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it can work backwards too, where like you over qualify it with cannabis where it doesn't necessarily apply, but you should always look outside of cannabis. Always. There's so many outside of the box things that you can bring from other agriculture into cannabis that will apply. But do remember, not yeah. everything always applies. Um, yes, yes, yeah. yes. This would be a speculative thing, not like, a, 
you can definitely just bring in anything wholesale and assume it's the same. Yeah, definitely. I was reading a paper the other day, and, and this is something that I experienced myself in reversing like large populations of hemp. Um, mm -hmm. But they found that hemp reversed relatively well compared to drug type cannabis consistently. So even though they are the same plant, mm. because one has elevated THC drug levels for whatever reason, it is much mm -hmm. harder to reverse than like the CBD type plant. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, coming back, I think this is the this is actually a follow up to dude's question, and it's probably the last question we'll get to for today. Sounds um, good. In terms of breeding scenarios, we have a couple of like miscellaneous breeding questions we'll also answer at the end. Okay. So Dudeness, uh, his follow-up. I'd like to try to reverse the sour diesel male, quote, the quote-unquote sour diesel male, to possibly get a nice female individual to pair with. Once selfed, how many crosses of the progeny would be ideal to get a decent look into them? Um... Well, first of all, like, what is the benefit of reversing the sour diesel male? Like, I, I don't know much about this, so maybe you can speak to that. So in reversing males, you use a different chemical than you would for reversing the females because we're not blocking ethylene. We're trying to get it to, you know, have a lot of ethylene in it. Um, when you reverse a male, just like when you reverse a female, you don't just get a perfect male version of a female. You get a male part mm -hmm. on a female bud structure. Vice That's versa, right. on a male, you get female parts on a male bud structure. And while you can make seeds with this, not all seeds are viable done this way. Um, and also, mm. you're not getting a full male line either. You're getting a regular seed line when you yep. do male reversals. So there's two things to understand yep. there. I mean, if you want to understand what's in your male, I, 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 it's definitely worth a shot. Definitely do it. Worth a shot to see what's in the genetics of this male you have. You know, if you think it's mm -hmm. sour, reverse him and try to make the seeds, see if they're viable, give them a pop and see what's in the line. Um, yeah, it's, it's doable. It doesn't mean that it's going to be remotely easy or it's always going to be viable, but it's definitely doable. Yeah, yeah. And I think the rest of the question is quite similar to the previous one, which is like, if he does do this, um, how far should he take working the progeny. And I guess it just comes back to what we said earlier. Well, it depends yeah. on what you find when. What's your goal? Yeah, and what your goal is, um, which, yeah, he didn't specify. So I think maybe then our response is mostly about the male reversal and what, yeah. you know. And you so can use things like Ethafon, mm -hmm. um, Florel, yeah. to do male reversals. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha. Is there anything else interesting to say about male reversals? Uh, I mean, most people do it not to make most people do it not to make seeds. They do it to see what the terpene profile like to make the male produce more essential oils or oils so it could so you can see what kind of traits maybe it might be passing. You know, like oh, I can identify this is the male trait because I smell that in the male uh, the resin glands on the male that we did on the reverse male. I can smell that there, and that wasn't in the female, so I know that's coming from the male side, or it's most likely coming from the male side. Um, that helps in some scenarios. Um, maybe okay. I just I have my own question about this. Um, Do it. Let's say you you had you know your blue bonnet male, the mm -hmm. you know now almost like mythical blue bonnet male. Yes. Could you have so technically you could have reversed that on like you could have self that. Yes. And what would you get out of that? Like would that have been probably something similar to. If, if I knowing the line, it probably would have been something similar to what I'm seeing in the blue bonnet, the X1 or the F2 is realistically because it's already yeah. so uniform. So yeah. it's, it, it just really didn't really serve a purpose in that sense, in that scenario. Cool. Nice. Okay. That clarifies it for me. Okay. Um, so I think those are the scenarios that we have for this week. Okay. Um, I don't. I. I'm not assuming. Sorry. I'm. I'm. I'm assuming that we will have more episodes if people have more uh, scenarios to suggest. Sure. Um, so if people still do, um, please keep sending them to me in the on in the Discord uh, on the in the content suggestions channel. 
uh, for future episodes. I think, yeah, Matt and I haven't really decided like how long this breeding series is going to be. So yeah, just playing it by ear. Playing it by rear. Um, <laughs> Indeed. Um, okay, so I guess we've covered all the breeding scenario suggestions we've got. Matt, was there anything you want to add at this kind of like wrap up of this section? No, not yet. I don't think so. They were pretty cool. It was, I think yeah. what I can say is that I can tell you that the vibe for this this week's episode is so different from our very academic vibe last week, and I'm already enjoying it. Not that I didn't yeah. enjoy last week. It's just very different. Yeah, it was just more, um, I think, more brain power involved in last week's for sure. Yeah. For me, it yeah, was. This was more heavy. It definitely was for me as well. Yeah, and it's nice to kind of have that now as something we can reference and like yeah. point to. But I'm also yeah, glad we is. did it and that we yeah, me too. have done it. Okay. I'm glad we did it too, baby. <laughs> it's not over yet, Matt. So I wonder if, I wonder if uh, MC Whiteout liked me whispering that into his face right here. <laughs> <laughs> I love that mic cover. It's I do too. Isn't that awesome? Um, okay, so we can wrap up with a couple of quite interesting questions about like, they are about breeding, but they're also more about like the supporting infrastructure. So McMuffin, for example, kind of wants to know like how different breeders stay organized. I think he specifically had a mention of like notes, whether there's like, you know, you've developed your own like shorthand for things, you know. I know that you might have some stories from yourself and from like maybe CSI. Yeah. yeah. How what what's organization like as like a commercial breeder? So like me and CSI are the perfect like polar opposites on organization um and I, I didn't really understand this i mean i've seen like you know people talk about taking notes and notations and stuff but i didn't really understand how organized someone could be when it came to breeding until like he started showing me like his paperwork on like when he would go through and do testing on different things you know like i'd watch it was just so detailed everything was so detailed and he know you know like has everything written down cataloged pictures, catalog, like, and when it came to me, I am the opposite, like my organize, my organization, my life is just chaos, pure freaking chaos. So I have never written anything down. Everything's been in my head. And like, I always kind of use the reasoning that like, well, if anything ever happens, like, I don't want to have anything out there to, you know, be incriminating or anything crazy. But like, in the end, it really was just me being lazy because like, I'm just not organized. So I've tried doing it in my head, which it worked for a long, long, long time until now when I'm getting older and like, I'm not, I don't want to say I'm getting older, like, you know, like other people, but like it, I'm further in my career and it's getting harder to remember a lot. It's really getting hard to remember yeah. certain details. And I see why he does what he does. And I'm trying to incorporate it more in my life now too. And uh, this last round of the punchy stuff, I took better notes, you know, and, and it was, because of what I had learned from him. But yeah, he's a he's definitely a good mentor to have when it comes to how to take notes and notations. And he does have somewhat of a shorthand. Um, it's usually by tag number, by look, mm -hmm. smell, taste, eye. You know, and it's detailed. It's very detailed because you want to be able to yeah. reference all those fine nuances and, and, and anything that can be construed or bred with as a trait you want to write down. Um, and that's not always readily apparent. Early on, the, the one thing that I did used to do when I was super interested in breeding purples was that I took notes on all the tags and I would always write down the color of the cotyledons or however you say yeah. it. I don't know. Um, I'd always take uh, take notes on whether they were purple, green to start with to see if there was any correlation mm -hmm. to that and flower. And yeah, I, I, that was the, the first notes I'd ever taken on anything just because I was interested. But I can continue that terribly long too far in yeah i think yeah for me as like someone who comes from like you know information technology and like and all that like i'd be i'd have spreadsheets have a fucking database <laughs> i'd be like i'd be going hard yeah. maybe man we can and, collaborate on something yeah and so now no, like, already but yeah. yeah and now that you're growing to know me do you see why like I, my personality is like i've never kept shit i <laughs> just don't like i'm so scrambled at that at the same time, I, f I feel like for you to have the kind of recall that you do, you must have internally some some kind of like, yeah, internal structure that your brain is using to, 
yeah and i'm curious to know what how how that might be happening. so like i've tried to stop doing it but like on the live feeds i would do it a lot where i have to like when i think of something i would close my eyes real quick and i go to my file system in my brain that i've tried like visually yeah. doing and accessing yeah. it that way but um yeah, I got a lot of brain fog now. So I don't, it's not as easy to do that anymore. It used to be very visual. Everything was very visual and quick to, and now I can't really do that anymore. There's a lot that isn't there. Yeah. So you're doing some kind of like a little bit of that, like memory palace type, type stuff. You heard of that? Where you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never been able to do that. I don't think, but I think it's my form of that maybe. Yeah. I think everyone has like some structure in their brains. I see screenshots. Like screenshots but they're not even visual screenshots they're just i just think about it and it just places and it's fucking weird i don't know it's not even visual <laughs> representations of anything it's just bullshit you know maybe i just close my eyes and pull it out my ass i'm not sure but somehow it works hmm, it's interesting maybe i'll go and like build some little thing for this for fun it'd be maybe. fun okay yeah i mean i can easily see like a a very very simple like breeders notes kind of tool which is not absolutely not far beyond like a spreadsheet but you know maybe made it it's not far it beyond easy. what you've done with the codex to be honest with you it's not either no it's not yeah i could see like a i mean a lot of that would cross I did over say this to you as well I, I did say this to you as well that the codex even though currently it was intended for historical plants and projects there's no reason why you can't use it to design projects either yeah. Um, or track your actual projects. So definitely something for us to think about for the future. Definitely. That's cool. Okay. So kind of related. It's still to me about like information. And I it's it's one that many people have asked. Like it's this one's from Humble FC in particular, but my friend okay. um, Bud Goodman was also asking me about this, which is clarifying some of the terminology. So I can just say this off the top of my head, right? You've got strains, you've got strands, you've got cultivars, varieties, you've got clones, you've got um, individuals in general. Um, yeah. You've got phenotype, um, you've got lines. And okay, I will say this, I'm actually not, to me, some of this stuff is still really blurry. Um, some of it is not. For example, I, I think I can e immediately say that a phenotype does not designate an individual plant. Correct. It is a particular expression of a single trait. Um, yeah. That is what a phenotype is. But yeah, what about stuff like, what is your understanding of like cultivar or variety? So, or like... so, so I, I've always understood like cultivar as a cultivated variety and that like the, the simple definition is a plant variety that has been produced in cultivation by selective breeding. So a lot of this to me is very hard to call a cultivar by yeah. mm -hmm. the most stringent standards of the word. And like, mm -hmm. I'm not anal about a lot, but some like verbiage I'm super anal about. So it's hard to call a lot of these things cultivars, but some might be. Yeah. Yeah. But most like, most cultivars are done with like root and stem cuttings, um, cell division, um, grafting, like careful yeah. selective seed production. And that's, that's a very, very specific qualifier for a cultivar. Yeah. Specific, selected, carefully selected seed selection. So yeah. Some things I think would qualify and others wouldn't in cultivar. How about everyone's favorite strain, right? Because I think we can immediately say, for example, Chemdog91 is not a strain. Is anything actually a strain like in cannabis? Like I know, okay, from a technical point of view, I know that like strains are used for like viruses. Yes. Um, in, a, in a technical sense, right? But for in cannabis land, people use it as just like a catch-all term for like, anything that has a name almost yeah. whether that's like a, a like a cross or an actual individual keeper people yeah. will still just freely say that's a strain or like that's a strain or um i think so there's a few different definitions of strains out there right like most people when they refer to strains are referring to like diseases viruses um or like strains of endomycorrhiza or bacteria right but there is also a, a definition of a strain and it's 
and it's in connection with uh, what is it like just I'm trying to think of the the word uh, a plant that has been modified through selective breeding or through breeding not say selective breeding through breeding so yeah it applies in cannabis it actually does apply and is correct um Okay. While strain seems to apply to most things because it doesn't necessarily specify careful, super controlled selective breeding. It just says done with selective breeding. And that can be many different things. That can mean many different things to many different people. So I think it more applies overall than cultivar does specifically. I'm sure yeah. people will be arguing I... till they're blue in the face on that. But yeah, that's my take on it. I can say this from the point of view of like the English language at large and mm -hmm. like its use in different practices and fields. Just because one term is used in one field doesn't mean you can assume that that is the correct definition in every field. Yeah, There are many fields that use the same terms in very different ways. Absolutely. So just because you've heard the term strain in like virology or I don't know, I'm not, I don't actually know what those things are called, but you know, just because you've yeah. heard that term used in another technical context, doesn't mean that that's the only meaning that it has. Correct. Um, so I think that goes back to, to what you were saying about strain. Okay, in terms of like separating an individual plant from a line, you know, what would you say about that? Like, what do you mean? Sometimes, you know, in a cross, you'd, you'd see like um, uh, this parent by that parent, but like that's obviously an individual. It doesn't okay, necessarily so represent the entire line, right? Like that kind of thing. So when I say expression, I, it could be, I, I use it very loosely when I say expression, because it could be like, a trait I like expression. to use it, a trait expression, but I tend to use it for a plant's overall expression, how it's expressing in that. And by the reason I say that is because it's ex, how it's overall expression is in that particular environment with that particular stringent set of variables. So expression works well with me. Like that's, that's a, that's a term that does work. But a lot of people say that phenotype, that's the yeah. phenotype from that line. And phenotype is refer, referring to a specific trait expression, not the right. overall plant. The overall plant is not the phenotype. You can say the genotype is XYZ, and that's relating to the genes behind the, ex the, the physical expression, but the genotype isn't something you're vi necessarily visually seeing. It's something that no, the underlying no. genes. No, by definition, it's not what you are observing. Exactly. By definition, yeah. Yeah. And I think the other term I've heard that I think I use with when you're talking about the plants, it, it just to use the mm -hmm. term individuals. This yeah. is a that's great know, too. Bubbleberry V two individual. Yep. Yeah. And that applies very well, very very well. Yeah. Um, and and strand things like that. You know, obviously <laughs> that's not. What, what it's called, but people do it anyways. Um, there's also like uh, the other things I hear are providence instead of provenance. Like there's a lot of terms that people have tried to move on in or use and adapt and don't quite fit. But yeah, those are the two big ones, strand and providence. I, I think that when you get strand out from strain, I think in linguistics is called like a, it's a kind of slippage is what yes. they call it, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I think one, one thing I'll say is that you have people on one end who think, oh, fuck, it, does, it just doesn't matter. Like, as long as generally people know what I mean, it's okay. And you mm -hmm. have people on the other end who are like, almost like unwilling to communicate with you uh, unless you have like locked everything down. And yeah. we're never going to get to that end either. Like, it comes no. back to what you were saying, Matt, about like, there's unfortunately unfortunately a bit of a blurry line between the established scientific terms and some of the terms that we consistently use as a community of practitioners yeah. and we unfortunately are going to have to deal with some of that ambiguity because language just isn't perfect and yeah. we definitely don't have perfect language for what we're doing yet um hopefully one day we will get closer but I think so. I, I just think that either end of that spectrum is not for me. Like, it doesn't really make sense either way. Like, you, you can't just say anything goes, and you can't say, like, we have to have it perfect before we can talk. There's yeah. obviously some kind of sweet spot between those two, and that's where we are.
I think so. Sorry, just as a language it. person, I just want to say that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, those are the two questions, miscellaneous questions I thought I'd throw in there to wrap this episode up. Um, maybe I did want to gesture towards some possible future episodes. Okay. Um, like I said, we might just have another episode that's kind of similar to this. If people have more um, scenarios that are different enough from the ones we've covered today, maybe we'll do another episode. Um, there's a possible suggestion from Quasia to do a separate episode on baselines. Oh, and yeah. When, when we say baselines, I think Matt has referred to that in the past as like the big names like Hayes, Skunk. Uh, what else is in there, Matt? Lord Knights. Um, uh, Lord Knights. There's Durbin. There's, there's a lot. Of, there's a few overalls, but like majority speaking, Skunk One, Lord Knights, Hayes are the big three. Yeah, so the kind of major precursors that um, kind of like the upstream parents, uh, the upstream nodes to a lot of the uh, cannabis that we see today. The majority. Um, and that, the majority. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that could be cool uh, for an episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the other exciting uh, possibility is we may get High and Lonesome back for another episode because he did tell me that he would be quite keen to speak on breeding for recessives. And also to speak on his Appalachia project, which obviously, you know, is a is a big story and has, you know, many oh, twists sure. and turns. So that would be very fun to do. Yeah. Um, so there's plenty, plenty for, for people to look forward to in the upcoming episodes. Absolutely. And um, let's see. We also have the uh, C2 custom glass. Just I, I think tomorrow I get to see the Breeder Syndicate versions Ooh. of the, their glass pieces for the first time so i'm super stoked man like i think that's one one thing like I, i've talked about it like you get leveled up every once in a while um in certain things and like glass is not my forte right and i didn't i don't i didn't really understand it being anything more than just a thing to get from point a to point b a tool, a yeah. tool right to get from point a to point b smoke to lungs but i didn't really understand that like there are certain techniques that can be used in glass for making things clear fast. And like, these are overall so much better than any piece that I've ever had. Like the fact that we get to have like breeder syndicate random ones blows my mind. That's that's end game end game type shit. So props to them. I'm stoked to show them, um, show them to everyone and make them available too to everyone, which is rad. It's epic. So yeah, I'm stoked about that. I do want to add one more thing uh, while we're doing this kind of like outro, like, um, I've been watching our stats and I'm really, really pleased to see that the engagement for the last few episodes has really gone up. Like we're getting the most comments that we've ever gotten really like yeah. um, in our recent episodes, you know, not counting like very, very old videos that have been around for years. Yeah. Um, we're getting like as almost as many comments as those in the, in the space of like a couple of weeks. So yeah, um, so I'm really keep, stoked yeah. about that. Keep commenting, keep, keep uh, interacting you know, like I like engaging with people in the comments because it's fun. Like it just it just takes the episode further, learning further. And I, I actually some of the comments, like if you go through there, like you'll catch like old vets talking in there that'll say who they are and you'll realize, oh shit, that's that person. You know, like people chime in that are really cool. Yeah. It's also the place where like if you're not in the Discord, because obviously people can use the Discord to do this, but it's also the place where if you um disagree with anything that we've said or you have more questions, like definitely bring them up there because yeah. like I said last week, we're not going to always be perfect. Um, we're going to make mm -hmm. mistakes. We're going to miss out on some things. So he's going to keep mistakes. prompting us because I don't <laughs> keep prompting us because we can always follow up. Yeah. Like, actually I, I'll mention that, like, for example, uh, it wasn't in the comments, but not so actually popped up in the chat last week to kind of clarify that a plant can actually be true breeding just for a, a one trait. Yes. Um, and that that's not the same as a plant being true breeding for a whole bunch of significant traits. Right. Um, and that's true. That's true. So yeah. you could have one trait that's uh, your plant could be breeding, you know, homozygous dominant for one trait. And that's technically a true breeding plant for that trait. But yeah. you could also have a plant that's like, you know, homozygous dominant for a whole bunch of them. And then you yeah. have something that's a Special. true breeding plant. One of those. Yeah, more like it. Yeah. More like a quote unquote IBL, right? In yes. in that in that set of terms. So yeah, sorry. Random example of like, you know, good little follow-ups here and there. Yeah, it is. 
All right. So with that, I guess, uh, let me see. Don't forget to join the Discord. Don't, for click, mm -hmm. don't forget mm -hmm. to click like, sh subscribe, share, all that good stuff. The uh, things you're supposed to do to be supportive to shows you like, I guess. It does help. It, it really does help. Like It, it does. Us. So please do that. And, um, or hit dislike if you fucking hate it. That's, that's cool too. Um, uh, I think that is it. Anything else you got? Am I forgetting? That's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Right. Cheers. Thanks for, from uh, us here at Breeder Syndicate. We'll see you next week. Catch ya. Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon in our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top-notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG, and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.